Good evening, and welcome to this edition of the In Focus Election Special. There were days we didn't think we'd be here, but um, all the talking is over, and the voting actually eh, should be done. Polls are closing. Um, we'll be here for the next probably couple of hours, taking you through, having some conversation, bringing you some of the numbers as soon as they are released from the Wayne County Clerk's Office. We appreciate you joining us, along with our partners from the Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce. Melissa Vant sitting in with me this evening. Nice to have you with me. Thank you. Got choked up right at the wrong time. Yeah, it happens sometimes. <laughs> we just kind of keep going. I don't think we have a choice during the next couple of hours. Um, we'll be joined by various people, hopefully um, in a little while we'll talk to Kathy Williams, Wayne County Treasurer. She's going to remind us about what you need to know as the spring deadline for taxes comes due on Thursday. Um, we'll also be talking with candidates that you haven't had a chance to hear from during this election season, those that are, have run unopposed. Um, a lot of, number of people have asked about our In Focus candidate forums and the fact that there were certain races that we didn't talk to. Well, they weren't really races. When you're running unopposed, you're just kind of there. We focused on those races that had um, candidates on um, both sides and we talked to those folks but tonight you'll get to hear and meet some of the candidates in the other races that are going on people that you might have a chance to actually vote for in the fall general election but we start our evening as we have I would say every year except three out of one year out of four we take one off we start kind of a roundtable discussion. We invite in the party chairs just to kind of get their feel for how things have gone. We're joined this evening by Gary Saunders who is a Wayne County Council member as well as Republican Party Chair and Tom Firkinoff who is the um, newly minted I guess yes chair for the Libertarian Party in Wayne County taking over for Rex Bell who Correct. held that position yes. for um, a number of years I'm not gonna step over Gary but Tom let's let's kind of start with you and uh, just a little background on yourself and how you came to this position okay basically I've been a practicing CPA for about 30 years now in public practice. Uh, worked for George S. Olive here in town for a few years before I started my own practice up in Randolph County, up in Winchester, Indiana. I've uh, worked with several different CPA firms and companies down in um, Cincinnati. I was the treasurer and chair of the board at Fountain City Wesleyan Church when we went from meeting at the school, took them through two building projects, um, worked with a lot of different nonprofits around town and hadn't really been involved in politics until this year I felt the desire to get involved and um, went to the District 6 Convention for the Libertarian Party expecting to get their blessing to run for the U.S. House for the district and came away as the Wayne County Chairman as Rex said he wanted to step down and convince me to pick up that monitor. So. Amazing how that happens. Yes. You walk into a meeting and suddenly you're the party chair. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Gary, uh, you've been around Wayne County politics for a while. Yep. I uh, started in 1970. I run for Perry Township trustee. I held that for 32 years. Opposed a couple of 32. Got involved in what we call county council. So I run against Jeff Plaster for the second district, and he defeated me by a narrow margin, but uh, it was still a defeat. Okay. So I uh, went ahead and two years later run for council at large, and I've been involved with the Republican Party. I served as treasurer for eight years, mm -hmm. and uh, was elected county chair. So this is your first go round as county chair. First go round as county chair. Uh, not afraid to say it. I'd still rather be treasurer than <laughs> chairman. <laughs> Go on. You aren't having fun yet. Oh, yeah. It's it's fun. It's enjoyable, but there's there's times it gets a little hectic. And, okay. Uh, we are joined by the third member of our, our of our team here to start off this evening, Beth Herrick, who is um, party chair for the Wayne County Democrat Party. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, we've met the other two gentlemen. Tell us a little bit about yourself. This is your first time as a party chair, yes or no? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, I'm proud to be just one year into my first uh, year of the four-year term. And before my tenure with the party, I ran a nonprofit, uh, actually a couple nonprofits in town, uh, and I took an early retirement to uh, spend more time with my family out of town when my father's um, cancer situation got uh, different so we lost him last summer and 
politics has been keeping me busy since then, okay. obviously. So that's been a, a nice addition for my life after, uh, now that I'm not working for pay, I'm working for passion. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm curious to, to start, what about this, because you all are first timers at this, what about this primary cycle where you all are supposed to be kind of neutral arbitrators as it were, what has surprised you about how this, this primary has gone? Beth, we'll start with you. Well, uh, you know, we've seen our local candidates, uh, we, we have had a couple of candidates with uncontested races, so uh, while we haven't come out fully endorsing anyone, um, we've been able to throw our support behind folks uh, because they've been, we've been unified behind them. So that's been nice for me. Um, obviously watching the uh, fray, the political fray above what I say is my pay grade <laughs> at the state and national level has been um, probably the most interesting uh, two-year cycle of, of my life. So um, I'll, I'll let others keep it local, but if you want to talk more about that, I'm, I'm happy to do that as well. Okay. So what about you? I mean, for me, it's very different because libertarians don't participate in the primaries. Right. Uh, we, we have ballot access because our Secretary of State candidates since 1994 have gotten over 2% of the vote in Indiana. When your Secretary of State candidate gets over 2% of the vote, then you can get ballot access in any county in any position that we can appoint candidates to. Um, if uh, Mark Rutherford, our candidate this year, gets 10%, then we participate in the primaries. But our candidates were appointed this past weekend at the state convention. So my function has been more just really starting to get the Wayne County Party, get familiar with people, try to find people who are interested in running this fall um, that we can't appoint to run four different different positions. But we spend our own money to appoint our candidates rather than having the taxpayers spend money to appoint our candidates in an election that very few people come to vote in. And thus it begins. <laughs> <laughs> and Gary, you've... You've been the busiest of the three recently because there are many contested races in the Republican mm -hmm. um, yes, there party. Were, you know, so. the, sh the sheriff's race is a three-way race. I know all the candidates. Uh, you've got to keep your mouth shut. Unless somebody <laughs> really asks you in prize, you know, real hard, you might <laughs> say something. But uh, uh, the negativism that's going on on a national level uh, with the 6th District and and then what happened last week with a thing come out of Indianapolis against uh, Dr. Barrett and I just, uh, mm -hmm. Wayne County's not that kind of, we don't operate that way and I just, I wasn't happy at all with that negativism that come out of there, so. Okay, you opened the door, so let's travel that road. <laughs> um, and and I've, the sentiment that you just expressed is a sentiment that I've heard from a number of different people, that Wayne County prefers to stay above that fray. But if the money comes in from the outside, and this is not its first attempt, and a candidate pulls it out and wins, and I'm not picking or choosing one side or another, does that not open the door? And how, as party chairs here, can you all keep that from happening? Obviously, the Republicans have statewide all the seats in the state, most of the seats in the county, but how can you all tell Indianapolis what to do and what not to do here when they send out mailers like this well, and nobody seems to know anything about it? Nobody it seems to know anything about it, but yet Dick said he had received money from that organization before he received $300, I think he said this year. He has in the past received money. So he called, uh, has called his team in Indianapolis and said that uh, he didn't approve of this, but then there was a second mailer come out, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess if it, the grasp I'm feeling is it may backfire. It may hurt uh, Dick real bad, backfire, and if it does, and uh, they may take notice that you know, hey, it don't work in Wayne County. Uh, but uh, that's true because I think. Um, mm -hmm. Like you alluded to, Eric, we are protective of our own, and we might not always agree with each other, but, you know, it's kind of like family. When somebody picks a fight with, with my brother, even though my brother and I might might fight all the time, we don't, by the way, but we used to <laughs> when we were kids, but you know what I mean? We would We would stick up for each other, and I think as a county, 
Wayne County might be different than most because we tend to protect our own. Don't don't come from the outside attacking. Yeah, it, uh, it's it's sad that that's the way politics is today. I mean, mm -hmm. you look at that race uh, between Rakita and Messer and Braun. That's been nothing but negativism, just attacking each other, not saying what you could do if you got there. And I think it turned a lot of people off. And that, maybe that's why we don't have near the voter turnout in the primaries when, as we do when, when that happens. So. Definitely. Well, it's kind of nice for um, Libertarian to not, not be in the primary because um, then you don't have to worry about picking fights with your own. And then by the time you make it to the general election, you know, you all you know, the p own party has already aired their own dirty laundry, so to speak. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, if, if, if we have a fight, it happens at convention, and none of the TV stations came to cover the convention, so it all stays private. Um, but, the, yeah, and I mean, when you talk about the Senate candidates, I was thinking of that today. I mean, there's times I question, why is Joe Donnelly running ads already? Well, he's been running positive ads. I mean, I think that's a brilliant strategy that he's putting himself above all the negativity the Republicans have had mm -hmm. in that. And I could... I, that may backfire in the fall on them. I think you kind of alluded to looking at the last couple of years and watching how things have turned. What's, what's your thought on the ads that have come out locally as well as even on a, on a state and national level? Yeah, well, I agree uh, with, with your assessment that the, if the state and the national government and politics could learn something from how we're able to sit together, how we're able to talk to each other. We have differences of opinion. We don't see the issues the same way, but we all ultimately want to act with integrity and want what's best for Wayne County. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that simple? I think we can agree on that. Um, and so trying to attack issues, not people, is, is something that I'm wanting more of and unfortunately seeing less of. Um, Showing who you, what you, what you aspire to be and do, um, as opposed to saying I'm going to affiliate myself with this person who maybe will help me if I claim to be most like this person. You know, uh, it's it seems like it's been a race to be the Trumpiest, um, and I think that that's not even a new word anymore. The Trumpiest has been coined by other people. So um, I'd like I'd like for folks to to I think. Uh, focus on what we want to focus most on, which is how do we solve the complicated issues and how do we be good people while we do that and have to reach across the aisle. Um, and and we're, we're hoping that the Democrats will help lead the way with that. As you, and this is probably directed more toward the two of you than it is Gary, because they've got races, multiple right. races, um, they've got pretty much the entire ballot filled. When you're looking to be able to discuss issues and bring things to the fore and talk about the other side of things, what do your two parties need to be able to do to really kind of come to the table and do that? Because when you look statewide, the Republican Party has a supermajority, all of the offices in the state. When you come closer to home, they have all of the offices in the county, mm -hmm. um, and and even when right we now. get to the, right, right now, right now, but <laughs> that, that's, but it's been that way for a number of years it right has. now. It has. Um, yeah. So so, what do the Democratic Party? What does the Libertarian Party need to be able to do to find and field candidates that? people can take seriously, and what is the message that you all think you need to be able to provide to at least begin to make some headway and at least be able to bring that dialogue? Because right now, there's not a lot of conversation going on. And I don't care who starts. Well, let me make a comment there. Okay, go. <laughs> because Republicans have candidates. The voters have a chance to pick who would run for that party seat. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's supposed to be about. Uh, just have a convention and you just point people to run. Are they the qualified people that the ch people actually get a chance to look at and, and pick? That's my issue with the whole setup. You know, we, we, you know, we aired out in, in, the, in the spring in the primary, so mm -hmm. we, and uh, of course, 
it's good when you don't have anybody running against you in your run. It's, <laughs> there's only two ways Are to run. Are you speaking from experience, Gary? <laughs> there's only two ways to run, either scared or unopposed, you know. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, you know, I, I feel like that's one good thing about what we have with the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. People have got a choice in the spring and who they would like to see run in the fall. I, th um, I think these two parties would like to have that, but they haven't had it for a while. Right. So what message is missing to turn those voters? Because I've talked to a lot of Republican people in the area, and at times they sound probably more libertarian than they do Republican, but it's easier to get elected if you're a Republican. Yeah, exactly. And I think as far as the message, I don't think our message needs to, claim, to change. We need to keep proclaiming our same message that we've been proclaiming since 1971. But you know, there's, there are stereotypes to overcome. And I think there's, when we talk to people, as you said, a lot of them are more libertarian than Democrat or Republican. And many of them, when I talk to them, it's, well, they feel like if they would vote for the libertarian, then that's going to allow the Democrat to get elected. Or if they vote Republican, that's, you know, or the Democrat's going to let the Republican get elected, that they're afraid that, you know, they're going to throw their vote away by voting for somebody who thinks more along their political philosophy than voting for that party. And so it's really just a matter of overcoming that stereotype that we can't be a major player. And you know, I think for years we were making progress. I think the lab, when I look at results the last two elections, that progress has kind of stalled. And so we've just got to start you know, getting a little more visible and a little more forceful in preaching our message to get the ball rolling again, to get you know, people to know that we really are a viable option. You're right. I think th I have heard quite a bit as well um, from Republicans saying, you know, I don't want to vote Libertarian because I think it'll split the vote and open the door for the Democrats to sneak in. Um, but, and so I do think that that's a, a concern among Republicans from what, I've, from what I've heard from folks around the area. But more and more there are moderate Republicans and you kind of fall in that moderate range, I think. Yeah. You know, Wayne County is on sound financial footing, and we carry over a balance, and uh, we really handle the money well. So, you know, it's, hey, it's hard to, for another candidate to come in and say, I'm going to do this when, when it's already done. As far as money management, we don't have a, we don't have a wheel tax. We don't have a food and beverage tax. It's got to be a big issue on, on one race, and, and but... It's, it's not going to come up this year. If it does, it'll surprise me, but uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, if it does come up, it's got to have a lot more planning in it than it does at this present time, let's put it that way. Go back to you. We were talking about what's the message? What is the conversation that needs to take place so that the Democrat Party, on a county level, from a city standpoint, yeah. doing okay. From a county standpoint, not so much. How do you begin to build that momentum throughout Wayne County? Yeah, there is a momentum. There really is. I feel a stronger energy than I have uh, s since I moved here in 2001. So I'm excited about that. I believe that uh, our messaging has been true throughout, and it's promoting that, amplifying that. I think Tom was saying that as well, that if... Um, if, if we can amplify the message of the fact that we, we want people to have a fair shot, we want people to work their fair share, and we think that everybody should play by the same rules. Uh, we, we're for inclusive um, government, inclusive um, uh, workforce, and, and um, we want to build up uh, our community by, by values of respect and um, and I think that that resonates with people. We're for the common working man, the common working woman. Uh, and those are people like me. <laughs> I think those are people like you, you know. Uh, so, so I think that we're, we're making headway, but um, there is a perception out there that Wayne County is Republican. And um, when you talk to people, though, they don't always agree with all the issues that you might think a party line would go down. So um, the conversations I've been having with people and the energy and momentum that I've been feeling um, have been pretty, pretty powerful, and I'm excited to be a part of that. 
Okay. Feeling optimistic as, as the fall rolls around. I know you've got a couple of candidates that hopefully we'll talk to a little bit later on this evening that um, didn't have a, a, a primary challenge, but will be right. on the ballot in the fall. Yeah. Jeff Locke, Indiana State House 56. We're excited for his race. Nick Elder, County Council District 3. We're excited for his race. Both those gentlemen have been working hard out listening um, and I, I think they stand for the transparency in government um, and the people-oriented um, focus that, that we need right now. Have you had a chance to talk to uh, many of the candidates running for 6th District? Yes, I've talked to almost all of them. In fact, uh, one stopped by with little advance notice yesterday and I was able to make some time. We chatted for about 40 minutes. so. Um, I'm, I'm very eager to see how that turns out, but um, I think all but one have been in Wayne County, at least for something, mm -hmm. most of them for a public event um, of some sort, so we're excited about the prospects there. Tom, I know you mentioned that you all had your um, party convention this past weekend. Yes. Besides being named party chair, did you get the blessing to run for 6th Congressional District? Y yes, I did get the blessing to run for 6th Congressional District, and so that was, that was an exciting moment to know they'll be on the ballot and we can actually start campaigning and getting our troops together and trying to make some progress. So we're looking at a three-way race there. You mentioned uh, a couple of other statewide offices maybe that the Libertarians have people running yes. for? Yes. Yeah, I mean John Schick will be running for the um, Auditor of State and Mark Rutherford. We talked about the importance of that Secretary of State race for us. Mark will be running for Secretary of State. Uh, Mark was appointed to the Public Defenders Council back in 2007. You know, he's um, worked with really Democrats and Republicans as kind of the swing person, and you know, he's now the chair of that. Um, you know, he's an attorney in Indianapolis, very well versed in election law, which is one of the Secretary of State's big responsibilities. And yeah, I believe he's, you know, possibly the most qualified candidate in the ballot to to hold that spot. So we're excited about that race. And then Lucy Brennan will be running for Senate against Joe Donnelly, and whoever comes out of the Republican battle today. I um, mean, Lucy has run for Senate before. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's, I think, also a very qualified candidate, a very exciting person to talk to, and um, she's a businesswoman and just very level-headed person, a, a mother of ten, so she survived mm -hmm. raising ten, well, she's not done raising ten children, the youngest is three, I believe, so. That's a miracle um, in and of itself. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like if you can deal with a lot of young children, you can probably deal with Congress a little bit, and there. And obviously you get to jump into the fray a little bit now because after tonight, your ballot should be set. Should be. We've got a few spots that uh, haven't been filled. I mean, uh, local, you know, the township races and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And but I've had people contact me on that and see if we can't fill the slot there. And uh, but it's, uh, you know, and, and if the idea is after the primary we come together right. as 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 one, and we'll work together and help each other out. So, um, keep my fingers crossed that happens. Sometimes there's a little bit of hard feelings after a primary is over, but uh, you just gotta suck it up and go on. So, okay. We'll see how that goes. We're looking forward to uh, obviously seeing more of you all over the next few months. You've been laying low here just a little bit, but now your time comes. We'll have you back in the fall, and we'll see how this all comes out. Thanks for spending some time with us. Gary Saunders, Republican Party Chair, Tom Ferkenhoff, the Wayne County Libertarian Party Chair and 6th Congressional District Candidate, and Beth Herrick, Wayne County Democrat Party Chair. Thanks for spending some time with us this evening. Thank you for having us. Yes. We're going to take a short break. We're going to bring in Kathy Williams and find out um, a little bit about taxes. I guess there's uh, what we all don't want to talk about. But we also have some early numbers that I'm being told we'll be able to put up. So all of that is coming as we continue with the In Focus Election Special on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. with the Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce, and I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Chamber Chat, where we will be talking with Roxy Deer, our newest team member, and also Michelle Walther with Walther Farms, and our host for the upcoming farm tour.
Join me, WETV Channel 20, at 8 p.m. on Tuesday. I'm Al Bledsoe. And I'm Ron Chappelle, co-host with Al here at Crowley and Sir. On our next program, we have representatives from the Department of Veterans Affairs for the state of Indiana. Uh, we have Phil Crum, Adrian Bonner, and Mark Smith, who will be with us. Past that, that had served in the military. I would love to be able to go back in time and say thank you. You can see us on channel 20 WETV on Monday evening at 8 p.m. And welcome back to the In Focus Candidate Forum on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11, a service of the Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce and WCTV. I'm joined this evening by Melissa Vance, President CEO and CEO of the Wayne County Area Chamber. It's great to hang out with you tonight. I'm glad that you're here because I need some help getting through this. And we're also joined by Wayne County Treasurer Kathy Williams. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. Nobody wants to talk to you this time of year because you I want know, money. No, it's terrible. We've had a lot of people. People avoid you, don't they? They do, and then they they apologize. I'm so sorry. It's not you personally, but you know, <laughs> we know how that all goes. And I'm glad you asked me to come in because I would like to take this opportunity to remind all the taxpayers that the deadline is Thursday at 4:30. The office closes at 4.30, but as I have put in the paper and on the radio to remind people that we also have a drop, a drop box on the west side of the building, and I go back at midnight and pick up the payments. And my husband's like, okay, again, yes, we are. And those are all on time. As long as you put it in the box by midnight when I pick it up, that is considered on time. You can come into our office. We're open from 8.30 to 4.30 tomorrow and Thursday. You can pay at any any of the um, branches for West End Bank, First Bank Richmond, Wayne Bank. They also take payments for us. We do online payments. You can get online as long as it's by midnight. Um, I know there's a time switch with the vendors, so we do take payments that way besides putting it in the mail. And if you put it in the mail, one thing to make sure that you do is get a U.S. postmark. We've had people run down to the post office at five minutes till five. The post office had already pulled the mail, and unfortunately, it got postmarked the day after. And then people were really sad because they had a penalty, and I really can't waive those. So, Well, that's you make it so convenient by all of those ways that you just mentioned for people to get right. their, their payments in on time. Um, I don't know that people could ask for anything more than we do our best. all of we those really do. ways. Mm -hmm. And what a trooper to be out at midnight and your husband, really. bless <laughs> his heart. <laughs> we do our best and we do our thing and that's part of being a public servant. Mm -hmm. I have a passion for doing that right. and that's that going the extra mile mm -hmm. because a lot of treasurers and other people don't do those type of things. So I, I try. But um, one thing I could tell you about, if you, if you would like, is a program that I came up with earlier this year. This is something so, you were doing in some schools, correct, yes. with, with um, younger students? Yes. So a lot of people will come into the office and they'll say, why am I paying, so, paying you so much? What are you doing with all this money? Where does it go? You're just using it, blah, 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 for things that we don't need, and that isn't true. So I decided what better way than we're going to educate our future taxpayers. So we've gone to a lot of the local schools. They were wonderful to allow us to come in and do our program, partner with the teachers. And then we talked about when taxes first started back in the day, so to speak, and everyone had the same needs for someone to, you know, build the roads and to keep the peace and 
teach the children and all the different things and how all of that came about and then how they are fairly taxed. And we had pictures of different homes. You know, here's one that's on the top of the scale, here's the lower one, here's the middle of the road, but a family could live in any of the three, you know, mm -hmm. but, but the difference in value. And I was really amazed at how many of the children really just got that, you know, and then everybody, everybody got a tax bill. This was the fun part. Everybody got a tax bill and they got monopoly money and then they came up and paid the county treasurer. But we also had a sheriff's deputy we had a police officer, we had a judge, Judge Colger loaned us his gavel, so that's worked well. Um, fire department, Lieutenant Eric Holmes loaned us some equipment and oh, used that they no longer use anymore, but the kids had a ball just dressing up and doing all that. As you can tell, I'm going like this, but that's I have a so passion for fun. this. Yes. So what age group did you talk we to? We had um, sixth grade and then we've gone up through um, seniors. It just different schools had different age groups and we got the majority of them in in Wayne County. There were just a couple that we couldn't work out the, you know, they couldn't work out the uh, timeline or whatever, but we're going to go again next year. But. Sounds very similar mm -hmm. to the Reality Store and some of those exactly. other successful programs. And exactly. It is, it is great for our students to get that kind of education. So when they leave school, they have some real world knowledge, you know. Yes. I, I remember having conversations with my own children about, you know, it's different when you're living at home than when you yes. get out in the real world. And that really kind of brings it to light. And I bet some of that conversation trickled home to the dinner table right. and that, that kind of thing as well. That's what we told them, you know, we did the interactive because we had nine kids that we pulled out and they got to dress as the police officer, the judge, and all this. So that really made it fun on top of when we were all done, they turned around and their money that they paid turned around and paid all these people so they saw where the money was going. And I said, do me a favor when you go home, make sure you tell your mom and dad or grandparents or aunt, uncle, whoever, what you learned today. And a lot of them said, oh, okay, we'll do that. I said, you may know more than they do about where the money goes. Nice. So, so this cool is something thing. you're going to be doing throughout yes. next school year, mm -hmm. trying to hit some of the schools yes. that you didn't hit as well yes. as going back to other students? Yes, and most of them I went to said, now when do you want to do this again next year? We're going to put this on the calendar. Nice. And the kids in, enjoyed it, and so maybe next year we'll get a different group. You know, and, and it never hurts. It's like anything. The more you hear it, the more you're going to remember. Mm -hmm. And so, as I said, to be future taxpayers, they're going to know why they're paying this. And, and I did have one um, student ask me, what happens if you don't pay? So we went into that lightly about <laughs> what happens, but you know also you have to make cutbacks so maybe you don't have two firemen come when the barn's on fire. Maybe you'd only have one. We don't know. There's just, oh. So they, they kind of get what we're saying, you know, just that, that things happen when, when you don't have enough money to go around. You're right. And continuing that conversation, you know, I'm a, I have a marketing background. Mm -hmm. They say you have to see or hear something at least seven times for it to stick. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and obviously that's come into play during election season. Yes. Where you're hearing radio spots and getting mailers and seeing billboards. and um, But hopefully this type of messaging is going to resonate with those students as they move along through their school school years and then out into the public. So thank you for taking that extra You're time. Welcome. That's definitely You're going welcome. above and beyond the call of duty. Yes, and one, one other thing I did with the older kids is I reminded them when they turn 18 to go to the courthouse and register to vote. And I said, don't ever think your one vote does not count. It right. absolutely does. And that I ran for office and was elected and they're like, oh, Wow. <laughs> so they were impressed. Talking about voting, you're seeing some numbers appear on the screen um, beneath us. Those are early voting numbers only. Those are not the final numbers that we are going to get, but you're seeing where some of those numbers are coming in, and we'll be uh, talking about those um, in just a couple of minutes. But again, what just wanted to let you know that those are early voting numbers um, only. 
there were um, a total of 3,408 ballots cast, 3133 of those were early voting, and uh, 275 of those were absentee. So those are the numbers that you're seeing, and obviously those that are 100 percent, again, still 100 percent of the early voting numbers, and you're seeing, like Jeff Locke there, an unopposed candidate. Kathy, thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. No problem. The information that you're giving is, is information that, that we definitely need to have, whether we want true. to or not. True, true. Okay. Um, we're going to take a short break, and we will uh, change somebody else in the seat, and we'll run through some of these numbers for you as we continue with the In Focus Election Special on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. Hi, I'm Sherry Harlan, program host for Read Beside You. Join me on our next episode when our guest will be Dr. Jason Castleman, allergist for Read Health, and Heather Hart with Read Health Home Medical Equipment, and Jill Sisko from Dasco Read Home Medical Equipment. Join us Thursday at 8 o'clock on Channel 20 for Read Beside You. And welcome back to the In Focus election special on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. I'm joined by Melissa Vance, President and CEO of the Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce. And the numbers you're seeing appear on the bottom of the screen are the early voting numbers. Those are not final numbers, but they were able to release the early voting numbers to us. And those will continue to scroll as Melissa continues our conversation with our guests. We are here with Jeff and Jeff. Senator Jeff, Jeff Rotz mm -hmm. and Jeff Plaster, thank you guys for being with us tonight. My pleasure. Thank you. you. Bet. you bet. Of course, we are getting you in um, just to talk about a lot of the things that you've been working on in your current roles, and you both will be um, on the ballot un uncontested right now in the Republican Party. Correct. You look so happy about that. <laughs> just just got an a, uncontested I got a, smile came so, nice. so I got a phone call today saying, congratulations, you won. <laughs> First one wasn't even was my right wife. Yeah. You voted. Yeah, it was right after I voted. Yeah. My, so. uh, our friend Al Dillon, who is a former county councilman, uh, always said, there's only two ways to run, afraid and unopposed. So tonight we're unopposed, yep. um, but anytime you are opposed, you need to take that seriously and, and uh, work hard and try to get your message out to people. Right. So tell us a little bit about, I mean, we'll, we'll talk to each one of you, but in your current um, offices, tell us a little bit about what do you think the hot topics are and the things that really can be affected in this next cycle, um, what change can we as a community and you as a representative of our community make in our, in our state and county? Me first? Sure. Okay. Uh, well, I'm currently the president of the county council. I'm, uh, I'm the, the incumbent in District 2, which is the northern part of, uh, of Wayne County from, from east to west. And uh, there are a lot of issues before, uh, before the community. Um, the county council's role is as the fiscal body. So primarily we do budgeting, but we're also, of course, involved in policy decisions as they affect, uh, affect the budget and affect uh, spending. 
So uh, there are a number of issues, uh, as most of, most of the viewing audience is aware. Um, we have tried very deliberately to partner uh, more closely with the city of Richmond over the last couple of years. There are two major projects that are underway. Uh, one of those is road construction that um, is part of the Blue Buffalo um, attraction project. So. Uh, if you haven't been out that way recently, the Blue Buffalo building is, oh is coming right along and, and uh, we're months away from, from them opening. Um, and the road project in that area uh, at a cost of uh, something approaching $4 million in total um, is uh, a partnership between uh, the city of Richmond, the town of Centerville, uh, Wayne County, and the state of Indiana through their Community Crossings uh, Fund. So we've been able to pool our resources, get that project done, which really was a key to uh, finalizing the deal with Blue Buffalo, bringing 160 or so uh, good paying jobs to, to Wayne County. Um, another project that we're working closely with the city on is uh, is the cleanup and removal of the old Reed Hospital building. Um, we've, the city and, and county have partnered with Reed Health uh, to make that happen. It's been a, a long time coming, but we've finally got all the pieces in place. And, and as you've seen, that's um, on its way down and should be done, uh, removed later this year. So uh, those are big projects. The key there is collaboration and we need to work, uh, continue to work more closely together. Um, an upcoming uh, thing that we'll be looking at, I think, and again, in collaboration with the city and, and all of the towns, uh, is uh, what do we do in terms of attracting businesses? How do we grow the local economy? How do we attract people uh, to Wayne County and reverse the last three or four decades of loss of population. Right. It's a huge challenge um, and we, we need to focus on um, a planning process that will help us address uh, what do people in the county want, uh, what do people in each of the communities want, um, how can we work together to make that happen. Of course, uh, the, the food and beverage tax idea is the most recent that has come up. The chamber was involved in that uh, my feeling is that there needs to be a lot more planning go into the front end of that to talk about uh, what, what do we want to do and what does government need to help support. And then when we've established that there are some things that we can all get behind as a community, how are we going to pay for that? There are many revenue streams available. Can we do that out of existing revenue? Uh, or do we need to look at the possibility of increasing revenue? I happen to believe that for where we're at right now, um, it's kind of backwards to talk about a new revenue stream um, when we don't at this point have a concrete plan. So we're focused on uh, getting uh, some push behind a planning process and we'll be doing that in the coming months. Well, and I think that's an exciting you know, conversation to continue. And I love the fact you talked about collaboration a lot. And maybe it's because of my time being in the chamber the last three years. But it's really neat to see on a regular basis folks from the state, folks from the county, folks from the city, tourism, EDC, chamber, business owners, and business leaders actually all sitting down together, and of course not to leave out the educators, sure. K-12 and higher ed, sure. to solve real problems. Problems of the population decline, problems of quality or the need for quality of place mm -hmm. initiatives, um, getting more students prepared for school through preschool or you know some of those other topics <coughs> have been a part of the conversation and and Senator Ross I know that that's been something that you've been a part of in great detail 
Talk a little bit about Certainly. that. Certainly. So uh, e even as this week, I, maybe it was Friday or I guess today's Tuesday, so Monday, uh, conversation locally here of a couple folks coming to the state house and we'll sit down with uh, the folks at uh, FSSA uh, to talk about how we can move forward and help uh, early learning here in, in Wayne County and in, in the district. And so education is certainly key to it. Uh, I, I, what Jeff's talking about and the collaboration uh, from a grassroots level, uh, I think is is the biggest piece of the puzzle because often we, <clears throat> I, folks look to the state and they say, well, we need money, we need resources, and that's part of the puzzle. But in my opinion, without a grassroots uh, effort in collaboration from all those involved, that's that's where the real work is done. And so when that happens first, then it, it sets itself up for success. And so um, the governor uh, is next level jobs initiative. And so there, there are workforce development things that will come into play that we passed just this past session that, that uh, Wayne County will be able to take uh, part in and so uh, for training for existing workforce maybe for those who aren't necessarily involved in the workforce today but could be if they had a certain skill and so uh, so there's there's a lot <laughs> of good things going on and, and so uh, uh, I think it's perception as well you know looking at the glass and saying it's half full instead of being half empty uh, is is mm -hmm. part of what has to happen I think here and as a grassroots effort as well and so when when the community gets together and and the community leaders and the business leaders and and those in um, the chamber and and city and county it's all it all sets itself up for success and so <clears throat> I think we're headed in the right direction there's still a lot of work we're to do there's no doubt about it but uh, we're in a better place economically, I think, than we give ourselves credit for. Absolutely. So. I would just add uh, my other hat, besides being on county council, I'm the executive director of the Eastern Indiana Regional Planning Commission. Uh, Senator Rotz happens to be on our board of directors, as, as are you. Um, we have a 39-member board. Um, but our five counties are, are really working on that collaboration piece. And so right now we're engaged in a couple of studies. One of those is a workforce study. One of those is a housing study. Um, those are, are very much uh, related to each other because we're, we're looking at um, what are the needs for our workforce regionally, but also Wayne County specifically. Um, and what do we need to do to make sure that we have uh, workers, trained workers, for our local economy? Right. Um, and the housing piece of that is then how do we attract people? You know, one of the things that people look at is where am I going to live? Where am I going to? Where will my kids go to school? Um, and the housing piece is is very important. We have limitations in our current housing stock um, in specific price ranges, in specific okay. styles, um, and to identify uh, what we can do as, as a region, as counties, as communities um, to encourage private investment in our housing stock. Well, you're right because, you know, Valerie Schaefer does a fantastic job bringing um, potential investors in our community, mm -hmm. employers, and they're looking at those housing, um, the housing stock and what's available. They're looking at the quality of place. They're looking at the education things. Um, but then also the existing employers. We have a lot of people driving into Wayne County, Absolutely. living elsewhere. <clears throat> and if we increase that housing stock or if we do some of these other things, what, what will it take for us to encourage them to want to live in Wayne County as well and, and to grow our population Absolutely. and meet the needs? Absolutely. So that's, that's a really great initiative and appreciate you taking the lead on getting that getting that done. And it should be done, both of those studies should be done later this summer. You're going into a special session. What are you expecting to come out with at uh, the end of that? We are. So uh, Monday, this the 14th of May, we'll go into special session. I was over there yesterday and, and uh, went through the bills in, in a committee setting. And so uh, uh, we will uh, push four pieces of legislation through. Uh, and uh, I can remember three of them off the top of my head. Uh, one, we, we, because of the 
changes in the federal tax code. It required Indiana to change a few things as well, and so that's one of the bills. The, uh, there's a school safety bill, uh, which that w will go through, I'm certain, as well, and that provides some additional funding to schools for, for school safety and, and uh, the access to uh, some capital funds should they desire to change entryways or whatever if they're determined that uh, there are issues. And, uh, and then as well, a, a, uh, uh, they're going to survey every school building and every school district in the state. Uh, they got We have about a year and a half to get that done. Uh, to look over plans and and so uh, we're Indiana's we lead the way uh, across the US as far as school safety goes which we we should be proud of but uh, I don't think we can ever uh, do enough to make sure that the, the students are safe and and certainly uh, uh, the the teachers and everybody else in the school districts and so that will go through Probably the most controversial bill is the Muncie uh, School District uh, in Delaware County and, and Ball State uh, taking over the administration of that school district. And, and so uh, I, I believe that bill will go through the way that it's written. Uh, we sat through about three hours worth of testimony yesterday uh, on that. Um, and it, it is controversial. There's no two ways about it. It's a difficult situation on both sides. Senator Jeff Rotz, Jeff Plaster, Wayne County Council President. Gentlemen, thank you very much for spending part of your evening with me. I know you probably have signs to go pull up or something. <laughs> thank you very yeah, much. thank you. The numbers you're seeing on the screen, I want to remind you, are early vote numbers. Those are not final numbers. We'll hopefully have those um, a little bit into next hour. We're going to take a break and bring in another unopposed candidate from uh, Wayne County Council District 3. And we'll talk to Nick coming up in just a little bit as we continue with the In Focus election special on Whitewater community televisions WGTV channel 11 hello I'm Melissa Vance with the Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce and I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Chamber Chat, where we will be talking with Roxy Deer, our newest team member, and also Michelle Walther with Walther Farms and our host for the upcoming farm tour. Join me, WETV Channel 20 at 8 p.m. on Tuesday. I'm Al Bledsoe. I'm Ron Chappelle, co-host with Al here at Crowley and Sir. On our next program, we have representatives from the Department of Veterans Affairs for the state of Indiana. Uh, we have Phil Crum, Adrian Bonner, and Mark Smith, who will be with us. Past that, that had served in the military. I would love to be able to go back in time and say thank you. You can see us on channel 20 WETV on Monday evening at 8 p.m. Welcome back to the In Focus election special on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. I'm Eric Marsh, Executive Director of Whitewater Community Television. Glad you're joining us for this evening as we wait for final vote totals to come in. I'm joined by Melissa Vance, President and CEO of the Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce. As we go through this evening, the numbers you're seeing on the screen are the early vote numbers. Yours look pretty good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. We're talking with and have welcomed into the studio Nick Elder, Democrat candidate for um, just a lonely man out there. A lonely man. Wayne County <laughs> Council <laughs> District 3. How are you this evening? I'm doing well, Eric, and I am Melissa, and I appreciate being here tonight, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the, uh, the voters in Wayne County and talk to you guys. So. Tell us a little bit about you. We haven't had a chance to do that with you, so we normally give candidates a minute or two just to give a little background. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. In a nutshell, um, I grew up in Cincinnati. 
Uh, I served eight years in the United States Navy as a hospital corpsman. Uh, I did combat tours in Iraq as a, um, as a Kazavak corpsman, so we did casualty evacuations. And I was a part of a police transition team. We lived in an Iraqi police station, and we trained Iraqi policemen for nine months at a time, uh, combat patrols with them. So that's the first part of my life. I was very fortunate to get my undergrad from the University of Cincinnati um, in finance. Uh, while I was on active duty using tuition assistance, after graduation, I used the post-9-11 GI Bill uh, to get my master's degree in business administration from George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, Tawny and I currently live in Milton, and we own the Old Tin Roof Antiques. It's an antique store in Cambridge City. Um, she's from Connorsville originally, which kind of brought us to the area. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, we're very, very fortunate to have chosen a great place to live. So. Nice. Yeah. How's, how's business going for you? You know, it's good. It's picking up. You know, the winter time is always sort of a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we just finished up our spring antique fair. Um, got some great promotion from the chamber and uh, from the tourism board on their social media. So it was a, a good boost for us. And, um, you know, it, it was great. We just finished it up Saturday, and we had a lot of people, beautiful weather. And, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. We yeah. love Cambridge City. I mean, along those lines, just throwing that in there. Mm -hmm. We it's it is fun because each each area of the county, the different towns, they all have their own little flair, mm -hmm. um, their own unique <clears throat> things going on, mm -hmm. and heading over to Cambridge City and mm -hmm. walking the streets and getting some different types of food is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great place to be, you know. I, one of the things that's the threat of Cambridge City is all the shop owners work together. Uh, we co cooperate uh, well with each other. Uh, when one is maybe having an event, the others sort of chip in to be a part of it. And, uh, you know, I think that's the key to business is knowing that you're not in it for yourself and you're not in it just with yourself, that you have to have cooperation because if you don't, then you're out on an island by yourself and, and there's no resources, so... We've got you here, haven't had to put you on the hot seat, sure. so, so we've had a couple of, of candidates come through. Sure. Jeff Plasterer was just sitting here mm -hmm. talking about the food and beverage tax, which is something that was very, very mm -hmm. prevalent in sure. the Republican side of the conversation with you. Right. Is that a, a subject you want to weigh in on as to the need or lack of need for that in your mind? What I will say is that we have got to, as a community, have a five or 10 year or 15 year vision of where we want to see our county. And we cannot continue to ask groups like the EDC, like the Chamber, like tourism, to do that effectively and to promote our community without providing them with those resources. And I think it is a tremendous loss of resources that we could have had to pour back into the community and back into projects to make this place an even better place to live and work. So I think, I think it's an unfortunate that we haven't had the ability for business owners and and um, residents to even weigh in on the issue. I think that's very unfortunate. Um, but uh, moving ahead, looking forward to, to the no uh, November elections, I look forward to being able to work for um, work towards creating maybe an environment where we can have that conversation again um, because we need it. Uh, we need every dime we can get. And, and I don't think it's too much to ask. And we're one of only a few communities along the I-70 corridor that currently doesn't have it. Um, and so I think it is a uh, tremendous asset that we are missing out on. Well, it's interesting, um, you know, we talk about the need and what can be done mm -hmm. with those dollars and, and of course, you know, the conversation has been around, there are some existing dollars that we can tap and, and there very well may could, may be those dollars to tap now, but as you said with the five and ten year plan, and you're from the finance world, so talk a little bit about how, as an elected official, you can look at the needs and then also um, offer sustainability of meeting those needs long term without growing, continuing to grow the tax mm -hmm. base. And I think that that's from the Republican side, that's what we've heard is, you know, we don't want to keep asking for more money if we have some already. But talk a little bit about that. You know, um, I appreciate the question, Melissa. You know, I think that there's a situation where we, you know, I've, I've used the analogy a lot on the uh, campaign trail where I've said, it's like when you sell your house, right? So when you put your house on the market, you don't call the real estate agent and then decide, well, maybe I should do improvements to the home. Maybe I should do landscaping and change the interior. And you do those, you make those fixes first and you make those corrections first and then you market your home. And then you go forward and you say, look at this beautiful home I have to sell. Let's take pictures. Let's get the real estate agent, correct? So I think the same applies to our county. I think if we bring another 
five, and I've had this conversation with city leaders and county leaders. If you if you bring another 500 or 1,000 jobs into Western Wayne, into Cambridge City, into Milton, Dublin, Pershing, Abington, if you bring those 1,000 jobs, wh where do those people live? Where do they go to the grocery store? Where do they fill up their gas? Where do they go to the doctor? Where do the kids go to school? Are the Western Wayne schools, the Centerville Abington schools, the Richmond City schools, are they prepared for an influx of 500 or 1,000 new children? Those are all the answers we need to work towards, and I know you're working towards them. I know Valerie Schaefer, the EDC, is working really hard towards those, too. But those are the things that we need to look at, uh, because unfortunately, if we bring those jobs in, we have to be set. We have to have our, our ducks in a row so that those companies look at us and say, that's a great place to bring all of our employees to. Um, so I think that's a, it's a tremendous um, undertaking for any county government. But we have the, the added challenge that we have very rural communities out west in the 3rd District. And so a lot of those folks look at it and they say, again, if we bring 1,000 jobs out here to you know, the industrial park at 70, uh, where are these folks going to go? And so those are the challenges we have to look at. Or where are they going to come from? Where are they going to come know? from? So there's both mm -hmm. sides of those coins, mm -hmm. of that coin. And, you know, we do have, through the Eastern Indiana Planning Commission, mm -hmm. we have a great collaborative effort with our um, neighboring counties. But we also compete for a lot of those same dollars. Mm -hmm. And how can we be proactive in making our county attractive to folks? Yeah, you know, I think some of the challenges, and I'll speak to what's happening out in Western Wayne County, but some of the challenge is that livability piece. Mm -hmm. And so, as a millennial, why would someone, you know, I'm in my early 30s, so I might fit into that category that a lot of folks talk about, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm a, a young professional, right? And what would encourage Tanya and I to move to Western Wayne County as it sits now? And those are things we have to look at. We tell folks that, um, you know, we're a great place to live and work and play and all these things. And we are those things. But we have to look at our investment in those younger generation of folks and have something for them to say, we want to bring our kids back here to go to school in Western Wayne. We want to send our kids to Richmond schools, Centerville Abington schools. And we're getting there. And we have a great community base. And we have a great community out there. Um, but we really have to focus on building and building and building so that there is something for these folks to move to. Um, I live in Milton. We have, a, mm -hmm. we have a population that is just on the absolute decline, and it's aging, and the 65 and up population is, is the majority. And when you look at that, eventually you're going to get to a position where you have got to influx these younger mm -hmm. generation of folks with their kids and young families. And we have to look at becoming that community where people want to move. As you laid out your thoughts about running for mm -hmm. this seat. Mm -hmm. What were the two or three priorities that you feel like, and, and going forward, mm -hmm. you'll really have a chance to sure. really kind of get out there, but yeah. what are the two or three priorities that you're going to be talking to people about? Well, a couple things we need to look at is ensuring that our county departments are funded properly. Um, if we're running in the black and we say, congratulations, we don't have any debt and there is no deficit, that's great. But if our departments are not funded correctly, you look at the sheriff's department, they're having issues with the um, um, in-car cameras. We need to ensure that they get all those cameras. You know, we have three deputies on the road at any given time. Now, folks will say that that's nothing to do with the, the county council. You're just the financial wing. Well, it has everything to do with the county council. Whichever one of these gentlemen get elected tonight to be the next sheriff of Wayne County is going to have to work closely with the Wayne County Council. Mm -hmm to look at their budget and ensure that we have the proper number of deputies on the road, the proper number of funding. So funding, certainly. Um, we need to take a look at the pay structure for the folks that are um, currently county employees, um, our highway department, our sheriff's department, our other county employees. Um, I think we need to really take a look at comparable salaries um, around the area for, for instance, our, our um, truck drivers out at the uh, highway department. Mm -hmm. You know, are making probably a fraction of what they could be making in the private sector. There are folks who say, well, they work for government. Well, it's hard to attract good, good talent if you're not paying those folks the salary that they can make comparable somewhere else. They'll go somewhere else. So I think that's a big key. And improving the quality of life. Um, that is the number one issue that I think that we are, um, I'm not going to say lacking, but the number one issue that I think we need to really focus on is our quality of life issue uh, here in Western Wayne County specifically. Um, making sure that we have programs in place 
you know, we've got 74% of our kids that are on free and reduced lunches out in Western Wayne County. Statistically, one in three of our citizens living out there are living at or below the poverty line. And so if we're not dragging those folks along with us and really working hard to ensure that the most vulnerable citizens we have are not taken care of, then what are we doing? You know, the government's first responsibility is to take care of the people. The government's first responsibility is to ensure the people are fed and our people are employed and our people are taken care of and they have access to medical care and they have all the services they need. That's the government's first responsibility. And we need to do that and drag our folks along with us that are, that are still, um, you know, struggling. So. Nick Elder, Democrat candidate, Wayne County Council mm -hmm. District 3. We yeah. will have a chance to speak with you again. You bet. I look forward to it. Looking forward to it. Thanks for coming in. Hey, I appreciate spending it. Some Thank, time you. With Thank, us. You, Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a break um, and come back and talk to uh, Judge Charles Todd is with us. Commissioner Ken Poust is also in the green room. But we're going to take a break and take a look at a very nice piece that was put together by the Wayne County Convention and Tourism Bureau. Let you know a little bit about what's happening in Wayne County as we take a break from our In Focus Election Special here on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV. Channel 11. And welcome back to the In Focus 
election special here on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. I'm Eric Marsh, Executive Director of WCTV. Glad you're still spending some time with us as we run through right now what are the early vote numbers. We are still looking for final numbers to come in. Hopefully within the next half hour we should have those and we'll get those up as quickly as we can. Joined by Melissa Vance, President and CEO of the Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce and joined by a couple of gentlemen, Judge Charles Todd, um, when Superior Court won, and Commissioner Ken Paust, a longtime friend of Whitewater Community Television, yes. former board member. Yes. I'm glad to see real clear television coming through. Real clear, <laughs> yeah, you were on us for a while about that. It, we're looking uh, better. We've, you, we've you look very good. Appreciate it. I, I watched your early discussion this evening with the party chairs at home so I could see how it came through. And how was that? Oh, it was like HD, what is it, HD, the high definition television. It was perfect. Nice. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, very okay. good, very good. <laughs> I'm coming to you for money next week. So. I know. <laughs> I already saw the list of the last few years, but as you know, I've been willing to give you all that, but I got voted down. So I know. I'm, I'm hoping that you can get the top number this year. Well, thank you. Well, Nothing to ask. You never know. No. <laughs> We're so fortunate to have great community television. I'll, I'll pat Eric on the back because I know he won't do so himself, but um, does a great job communicating through the three stations, all of the great things that are happening here in Wayne County, and we're fortunate to have them. Thank so you. It is the staff that Absolutely. ushered you in and got you mic'd yep. up, and our volunteers that help mm -hmm. out. This is community television. Greatly appreciate yes. it. <laughs> Judge Todd, you are Superior Court One. What is that? For, for people who don't know, I've never been before you in, in the row, <laughs> and I don't want to be. Thank goodness. <laughs> but if I were before you, what would I probably have done? Uh, well, Wayne Superior Court 1, Superior Court 2, and Circuit Court have similar um, roles that they're serving. Uh, we deal with um, criminal, but uh, only criminal felony. So everything from, um, for example, possession or dealing narcotics, clear up and through murder, so criminal cases. And then we deal with quite a few family law cases. That could be a dissolution of marriage or divorce, modifications of that, um, things of that nature, uh, enforcement of support, whatever that might be in the family law arena. Uh, then we do um, personal injury, medical malpractice, all those types of civil cases, mortgage foreclosures, guardianships. Uh, probate cases, estates, when folks pass away, that's another segment of cases. We do mental health uh, hearings. Uh, a lot of those are done either at the state hospital or uh, at Reed Hospital. Uh, and so that's kind of a variety of things that we do. And then uh, Judge Dolahanny in Superior Court 3 um, does the juvenile delinquency. He does all of what's referred to as CHINs or Child in Need of Services cases, uh, misdemeanors, ordinance violations, small claims. So those are done in Superior Court 3. So the Superior Court 1, 2, and Circuit then more or less take a third of all those other cases kind of on a rotational basis. So unlike maybe larger jurisdictions, or larger counties, I should say, that maybe are a little bit more specialized in the jurisdiction. We see a pretty wide span in terms of the cases we handle, so it, it's never uh, boring by any means. But yeah, sometimes you know you have to try to dive in the uh, in the depth of what you need to 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 stay up with everything that's going on because it's so such a broad spectrum that you deal with. The the area has seen obviously an increase in a number of different types of crime here through the years. What are you seeing? the most increase in in your court and is there something that you can attribute that to? I mean, everybody's conscious of the fact that there's opioid um, you know issues and that those have come about in the last few years um, back in my um, former working life I was a probation officer I think you know that and mm -hmm. and uh, Bob Chamness who's a council person now he was my boss he's chief probation officer great great fellow I learned a lot under him and and when I was in probation you just you know, you saw a handful of those types of cases. Well, now you're seeing a handful every week uh, in every court. And so that's, there's been more proliferation of that. And, and I think that probably gets the most attention or the most media attention as well. But when you look at overall numbers, really overall numbers haven't been as inconsistent. And then when I first took over uh, back in 2009 or first took office, there was a lot of uh, collection work seemed like it was up there, foreclosures just because of the nature. Matter of fact, Indiana had a, a program that they went through in terms of trying to help folks going through foreclosure so that dealt more with probably some economic issues so right now at this particular time it's probably uh, the issues dealing with opioids and, and some of the things that stem from that area. So with the opio opioid issue um, one of the things that we hear often from employers is that 
there's a 3.1% unemployment rate, and so the people that can pass a drug screen and want to work are working. Mm -hmm. um, but, but to that point, are there things that you're seeing that either are being done or can be done to maybe reintroduce criminal um, opioid offenders into the workforce or back into society where they can be, um, get back on their feet, be a productive member of society. W what kinds of programs are, are there and what can be done in regards of connecting the court system to the um, rehabilitation centers and then back into the workforce? Is that anything you deal with? Well, I mean, you deal with it every day because there are cases there and what you're trying to do the best you can, you know, there are different aspects of criminal justice system and quite frankly, it might depend on your perspective as to which aspect might be the most important, what you're responsible for. For example, a person defending a, a, a criminal or defendant uh, or a person who's accused would be a better way to say it. And the prosecutor's office, they have different roles and different functions. I do know that um, the courts work with um, Mike Shipman, the prosecutor, to start a um, uh, pretrial diversion program, and that's had some successes. It's had some failures, as any program like that's going to ha have. And, and you get into a lot of debate too, whether or not it's a, you know, an uh, illness, a sickness, a disease. Is it indeed by choice? You get into a lot of those issues. And right. I've gone to a lot of things. Uh, Reed Hospital started a heroin is here group now. It's probably been about three years back, right. and then that's splintered into some subgroups. And I've been pretty involved in trying to keep a pulse beat on that. So I don't think there's any magic thing you do, but I think it's trying a variety of things. We're also blessed, you know, we have um, Meridian, we have Centerstone, we have, you know, Reed. There's a lot of people that, and a lot of people putting in a lot of effort and hours to try to address as best you can. And then there's a lot of community members that have stepped forward, uh, that their families have been affected. I mean, it's hard to talk to folks that in some distant way, or maybe a closer way, haven't been affected. So there's a lot of those types of things. And we're blessed that we do have folks doing it. Does it make the problem go away? No. But as we go to these uh, judicial conferences, you know, that cover the state, and we go to a couple of those a year, you know, you, you realize Wayne County is not, <laughs> not, not by itself. This is, these are issues that are being discussed. As a matter of fact, Chief Justice Loretta Rush is uh, kind of heading up a, an opioid a summit or seminar uh, that uh, you can um, form a team from your county, and that's a statewide thing. It's going on, I think, July 25th. And so we've assembled a, an eight-member team here from Wayne County. We're going to be going to that. So you're constantly doing things. They're not, per se, the solution, but it's trying to continue to work with folks and do things. But there's a, a certain sadness to it. You sure empathize with people's position. And then you have sometimes the other part of the job you have to do uh, that deals with the community and safety in the community, what's going on. So it's tough balance, right. tough balance. Really takes somebody with, with discernment um, to sit in your seat day in and day out because of just what you said yeah. with the, the balance of correction and care. And um, we, we appreciate what you do and, no, I, and the other judges and It's folks. flattering and I, and I appreciate it, but it's a, I mean, we're still human, we make mistakes and it's a struggle you know, every day that you're trying to do the right thing. The good news is we got folks in place that get up every day and work hard and try to do the right thing. And, and I don't have right. the corner of the market on that and neither do the judges. As a community, we're pretty blessed with some pretty good leaders. Right. So. Commissioner Post, you've been at this for a while. You've been awarded Commissioner of the Year and some, some other awards. Yay. And now you're running again. Well, what brought course. you? What brought you back? <laughs> what, what is it that you still feel like you want to do in in that commissioner seat? Oh, what? Well, not just the commissioner, but I'll say any of the elected offices that we have. It's a real opportunity to be involved in your community and to know what's going on. I mean, you interview a lot of folks, and so you're more knowledgeable of what's going on. But you know, if you get an opportunity not only in the government to see all the different projects that are going on, watch what the judges are doing, what they're doing now on the new computer software program uh, that they're implementing, which is a major undertaking that they're doing right now. So you're aware of that. So when you're with folks out in the community, you're able to talk to them and tell them what's going on. Plus, you have an opportunity that you can make something happen. The same as Melissa through the chamber has an opportunity to be able to make things happen within the community here. And so it, it's fun to do that. I enjoy it. I've enjoyed it my entire life. I will continue doing it uh, because you're there. You can make things happen. Uh, 
it's not always what people want to happen sometimes, <laughs> but at least you can make them happen. Uh, WCTV here with you, if it hadn't been for my job as a commissioner, I probably wouldn't have been on the board in the early days that you were putting all of this together on there. And, and so it's programs like that. I serve on the chamber board as a member of the commissioners. Uh, as a commissioner rep, I have about six or seven other boards that I serve on also. So you're very knowledgeable of what's going on in the community. And I thoroughly enjoy the job and doing it. And I feel I'm, I do a good job at it on there. And so as long as my health is good, I will continue working on this and doing it. And right now we've got, oh, guys, probably 25 projects going on within the county. So it's a busy, busy project. People say, well, gee, you retired. And I said, no, I really didn't retire. I work for Wayne County government now. And so I'm in there every day. And uh, it's a, just an enjoyable process and working with all the folks we have in the projects that we're doing. Some of those projects are, are really things that have to happen on a regular basis. Maintenance maybe that right. was put off because of lack of money or just didn't think well, about it, whatever. But a lot of those yeah. have, have come around now. Right. What are some of the big ones that people will see get finished here in the next little bit? Well, part of the problem is you don't see it. And so you have these major projects underway at this time. For example, in the jail, we have a water arrest uh, program going on in the jail. And that's been going on for several months. Uh, we had a roofing project which started last year in that. Uh, that is now finished up and will be completed by next week. So uh, you might have seen them up on the roof on there. On the courthouse project uh, mm -hmm. this year, or well, last year, uh, we washed the complete outside of that, washed all the windows on there, and this year we'll be doing the HAVAC system in the courthouse on there. So we'll be doing part of the heating later in, in the year, and uh, we're going to do that over a two-year project on there. And in the fall, we'll be ordering a new cooling system for the courthouse. And that will come in, it's about a 12-week lead time. So that'll come in, in in the winter months so that we can get that in place so when the warm weather comes, that project will be done and be in, in place on there. So those are a couple of the big ones, but they're inside projects. You don't see what has happened on those projects now. Outside, of course, if you can get through all the construction on there and you can get into our parking lot, can't all of happen. our ramps and everything that we have in the sidewalks are now all ADA compliant. And we're in the process, and this probably you wouldn't notice the ramps, you just walk up them. But we're now in the process of doing all of our restrooms in the annex, so they'll all be ADA compliant. So those you might recognize when you go in will be done. And we're started, we have the first one almost completed. We have three more in there to do. So those you will recognize as projects that uh, you can see a difference when you, because it was 1978 when those were, were built. It's amazing the number of things that the commissioners um, are responsible for, you know, from roads and bridges and buildings and right. um, people. So you have a lot of a lot of different things that you that oversee. Do, right. What do you think, aside from the things that you just mentioned, in the coming year or two, what are some of the big things that you? Well, can one see of the addressing? big things that's going to happen is uh, with the tax that the state legislature put on, the additional ten cents. And so we'll be getting additional funding. We're beginning to see that come in. So we have 750 miles of roads, and we're very proud of that, that you can go on our roads and you can't see any potholes. And we actually had one of the commissioners from Delaware County come down to Wayne County and drive our roads to prove us wrong. And she admitted <laughs> after spending the day down, you don't have any potholes in the county. And that's absolutely correct. So we're going to be having more maintenance programs underway, more paving that we'll be able to do on the roads on there. So that will be a real benefit to the community is that we move along with that big project. And what most folks are surprised at is the county has full responsibility for all the bridges in Wayne County. And we're about number four in the state of Indiana. We have 233 bridges. And so we work each year on trying to do so many bridges that we have on there. And then we apply for community crossing funding also to be able to do those bridges. And we watch very carefully and we inspect the bridges every year on there. This year you may see us inspecting uh, the Main Street Bridge and the 20th Century Bridge on there because we have to close them down for a day to, to bring in equipment to be able to go over it and go down underneath to actually do the inspection.
sections on those bridges. North 24th Street, we just finished that here just uh, last year on there, so everybody was happy that that was done on there. And today as I come out, I see they're laying the asphalt down on 27, so pretty soon that project will be done on there also. It's That's not our off. project, but anyway, <laughs> it all ties together on there as we do those bridges. There's another bridge. Uh, west on 25th Street that we'll be doing on there that connects with uh, New Paris Pike on there that we'll be doing on there. So those are just some of the projects we work on. Our fairgrounds, we're taking a long look at that right now. Uh, we spend actually over $400,000 a year. The council is allocated for that facility out there. And our goal is to try and bring that to where uh, the fairgrounds can sustain itself. And uh, we've just recently signed a contract with American Kennel Association to come in and do a big project here for about three or four days. So that's new. We're very excited about that. And we're going to look at the total complex. So we've done a lot of painting out this year. We put a new roof on the Raper Center. I say this year, actually it was in 2017 uh, that we got those projects all finished. So the fairgrounds is coming along quite well. We're looking at the drainage system out there and what additional things we can do to be able to bring more events into the area. And as the Chamber and Mary Walker knows, you know, we've got 45,000 square feet. We got one of the largest under roof expo exposition areas available. We just haven't marketed that. So we're gonna do a whole new web uh, program for our facility out there. And so make people aware and we're gonna go actually look and market people to come here for our facility on there. Mary Walker does a fantastic job of that, and as you, you know, talked about the different um, events that take place there that a lot of folks, unless you drive by it every day, you might not even know are happening out there, right. but it, it really drives, drives well, people are the amazed. dollars. One, one we have, Melissa, is the basket mm -hmm. weaving group that we have out there, and they fill that whole Kuhlman Center and come from all over. It's all basket weaving. So it's those type of groups that we're going to go look for to try and fill the facility up. And, of course, we have a great time out well, there with do. our Taste of Wayne County and Business Expo in the fall, and we'll, well be back and we're hoping eventually to get a caterer's kitchen in the Raper Center so you can move over to there because I know you're squeezing Coleman. That's right. You don't have enough room for all the folks that would like to attend. That's right. We would love that. <laughs> Commissioner Ken Pouse, Judge Charles Todd, thank you, gentlemen, for spending some of your evening with us. We greatly do appreciate it. Um, we're going to take a break, and uh, a couple of our... our employees, friends, helpers. Uh, Ryan Harris and Zach Watson were out at some of the polling centers today. We're going to take a look at some of the footage that they shot as they were out, as people were actually doing their civic duty and doing some voting. And we'll be back with uh, the In Focus election special on WGTV Channel 11. Keep up with local government information and shows with WGTV Online. Go to WCTV.info and click on the WGTV Online button. It's a live stream and video on demand site in one. Click the play button, you'll see whatever's on the air on WGTV Channel 11. Or scroll down for videos on demand. Choose whatever meeting or show you'd like to watch. It's easy to stay informed with WGTV Online, a service of Whitewater Community Television. Hi, Phil Quinn. 
Another episode of Access to the Arts focuses on the Nettle Creek players. It's a traditional summer stock company, uh, which means that we bring professional actors from all over the country. To and also the Secret Garden Tour, Richmond Art Museum fundraiser. We've got a special place where we're filming on location. This garden is different, and every year I think people come to see the different gardens to get ideas. It's another edition of Access to the Arts, Thursdays at 9 o'clock on WETV Channel 20. And welcome back to the In Focus Election Special on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. The numbers that you see on the screen that have been scrolling for almost an hour, I guess, now are um, early vote numbers. We have been keeping up with where um, some of the voting is going. There was a machine that was coming in, I believe, from Western Wayne County. They have it at the courthouse, I'm being told. We're, we're getting information in my ear. I hear voices. Um, <laughs> and hopefully we should have some final numbers coming to us in the next, uh, hopefully, 10 to 15 minutes. And then we'll run through some of those and maybe have a chance to speak to um, one or two of the winning candidates this evening. In the meantime, as we continue running those numbers, I'm joined by Melissa Vance, President and CEO of the Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce, our partner with our In Focus Election Special and our candidate forums. And we're also joined by Jeff Locke, who is a member of Richmond Common Council. But for the purposes tonight, although we may talk some council stuff, we'll okay. see, uh, the purposes tonight is a candidate for um, District 56 House seat. So yes, sir. you ran unopposed right now, yes, but sir. you will be running um, against someone. someone. We don't know who right. just yet tonight. Right. I'm, I'm curious to start off with what made you decide to go after that seat? Gave it a lot of thought. You know, and that, you know I, I, a lot of people know I've been involved, involved in politics for a long time. And after watching the uh, business of the legislature the last two years, uh, I felt this past session just sh showed that even with their supermajority, the, they are un ineffective. You know, they're coming back for a special session, which is going to cost approximately $30,000 a day. Uh, you know, they left some bills on the floor that probably needed to be passed. Uh, I think it's time for some common sense in Indianapolis. I think it's time for a change of leadership in Indianapolis. Of course, that would take a big part a lot of doing on the Democrat Party's part. But right now, the leadership in Indianapolis, the way they've ran the session this past year, the year before, they passed, or they raised taxes or fees on 45 different items. Uh, you know, you spoke of me being on city council. I think my city council record shows that I tend to be conservative on, on fiscal issues. I'll be more liberal on social issues. I came from Fayette County originally where the Democrats have been known to be more conservative than the Republicans. And so I've got that fiscal conservative, you know, in, in me. I think, like I said, my votes on city council will show that. So I, I think it, it's time for some common sense in Indianapolis, uh, you know, time to hold the line on taxes. One of the other reasons I'm running, they didn't talk about it this year during the legislature. Obviously, it's an election year. But in the 2017 session, they talked about making toll roads or interstates toll roads. Right. And, right. and, you know, with I-70 basically cutting right through the center of Wayne County, a lot of people out here on the north end rely on 70 to get back from one side of the town or the other. Uh, I think it also, we talked about this at a forum that, that the Representative Ham and Representative Saunders hosted about a year or so ago. If it's made a toll road, are they going to take better care of 40? I think it's going to dump a lot of traffic on 40 through town because there'll be penny pinchers that won't want to pay the toll. You know, so how far they studied this. So, I, you know, I'd like to be a, vo be a voice in that. Uh, but those are some of the reasons I just I think it's time for change uh, in Indianapolis. Change in this district. Of course, that change could come possibly tonight or it can come in November. But, you know, I, I just feel that we need to have a, a different voice in Indianapolis. Well, speaking of the toll road issue, you know, many people have have talked about that over the past year. And with us sitting right here on the Ohio border, should the toll road on 70 end at the Ohio border, the likelihood of people stopping in Wayne County 
for um, food and gas and entertainment and all of those things is really small. They right. would probably just travel right on through. Right. You know, and you know that's the thing. You know, is is Ohio entertaining? And if you've ever been down through West Virginia, you know the West Virginia uh, toll, toll road is just in West Virginia. So, you know, I haven't I haven't seen the uh, nuts and bolts of the of the bill, but they've talked about you know possibly making a toll road. Of course, this was in 2017. It didn't. There wasn't a bill introduced this year about about toll roads. But like I said, it's an election year, so they're probably going to stay away from that because it's going to be a controversial subject. Right. When do you, uh, so do you feel like that's probably going to come back to the discussion oh, in I the next year Oh, I think it'll come back so? next year because, like I say, next year won't be an election year. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's other issues that I'm concerned with. And, and uh, but. Uh, so you've gotten to kind of slide through this primary yes. season off the radar a little bit. Yeah. But for people who don't know you very well, um, they've probably been living under a rock of sorts, <laughs> but for people who don't know you very well, you said you were from Connersville. Right. Um, just tell us a little bit more about you specifically. I, uh, as I said, I'm originally from Connersville. I moved to Richmond 10 years ago. Uh, I spent 27 years with the Connersville Police Department. I was chief and assistant chief down there for a while. Uh, I retired from the Connersville Police, moved to Richmond because I uh, got a job with the Indiana University Police Department. And, uh, the last eight years I was with IU, I was the assistant to the chief here uh, on the IU uh, po police campus. Uh, so I spent a life in law enforcement. I've also been involved in politics a long time. I served as a county councilman, a county commissioner, a city councilman, and a township trustee in Fayette County. When I moved to Richmond, Sally Hutton and I, of course, knew each other. Sally asked me to run for city council, and I did the first in 2011, ran and lost. And then 2015, our random was successful. So I'm in my starting my third year on the Richmond City Council representing the 5th District, which is basically everything north of, uh, you know, where the health food store is, everything north of that health food store, east to west, I represent the north end of Richmond. Right. Before you ask your next question, I want to let our listeners know that the numbers you are seeing have changed, and these are the final vote totals from the Wayne County Clerk's Office. So the numbers that you are seeing are the final numbers for this evening. These have uh, just come in. Didn't want to break in, but wanted to let you know that so as those numbers roll by. Interesting to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. congratulations. You have 100% of the vote. I just well, saw your name. <laughs> yeah, the, too bad we can't translate that to November. But uh, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Like I said, I've been involved in politics a long time. You know, been involved in, in city government. Uh, one of the newspaper reporters referred to the uh, contest between Mr. Ham and Mr. Uh, uh, Barrett as a, the uh, energy versus experience. Well, I've got experience in county government. I got experience in city government. Uh, I work in a quasi-state government agency here. Uh, I've I've got the energy to go out and meet the people. I've worked across party lines for years. I've done it when I was in office in Fayette County. I've done it here. Uh, I th I feel my experience in in local politics qualifies me to run for this. Like I said, you know. I'm not afraid to talk to anybody about any issue. Uh, I've got the energy, and I'll, I'll be out in the neighborhoods throughout the county. Of course, there's four precincts in, in Wayne County that didn't vote for this district in, uh, up in the Hagerstown area. But uh, we'll be out working and taking our message out to the people, and we're excited about the uh, fall race. Great. Well, while we have you here, real quick, because I know we're going to be um, start, starting to cycle some of the winners in, but um, f City Council, okay. what are the hot topics um, that you're dealing with right now, well, and, think, and what do you think that we need to the, be the looking at? The biggest hot topic, obviously, everybody can see that Reed is coming down. Uh, you know, the mayor paid, played a big part in that. Of course, the council was involved in it to, to an extent, so we're glad to see that. Probably the other big thing is is our traffic problems downtown. Uh, you know, a lot of that is, is state projects. Of course, we've got the Stell Grant working on Main Street, and that should be getting fired back up here soon. Uh, I heard one of the other gentlemen was on the air before I was that they are getting the 27 J Street intersection paved. So right. hopefully they'll have that section of the project done soon. Uh, 
There's been other topics come up. Uh, a lot of it's in the Board of Zoning Appeals right now. So we'll wait and see if that gets deferred back to us or goes to the courts. But uh, we're through the RPNL board, which city council members sit on. Uh, there's two bills pulled last night that talks about net metering. And I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about net metering at this point, but I've gotten several uh, uh, inquiries on that. So those are probably the hot things right now. We're working on another parking issue, amending an ordinance, and, and that was delayed last night until uh, uh, some of the members of the police department could join us at the meeting and tell us exactly what they're looking for there. So. Uh, well, no. we hope that, you know, from a chamber perspective, we hope that, um, and, and you and I sit on the board for right. Center City Development Corporation, which has a brand new staff and yes. energy. It's exciting because we need to see revitalization downtown. Right. And obviously road construction, people, it's hard for people to visualize revitalization um, and how that can possibly take place because they're seeing, they're seeing businesses go out and, and construction. How do you see um, council addressing that? You know, we've seen the same problem when Chester Boulevard was being redone. Everybody that lived in Crestdale, Oak Park, and Berry Field had the same complaints, you know. Once it was done, it was great. We need to work on getting more jobs. You know, I think there's a qualified workforce out there. There's a workforce out there that's getting them qualified to be in the workplace, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, Ivy Tech can play a part in that. You know, the, the maker space or the innovation center, I'm excited about the new leadership down there. Nothing against the old leadership, but, but the new leaders down there are, are really excited. I'm also president of an enterprise association, and we'll have our first meeting with Mr. Russell tomorrow. So, you know, we're excited to move, move the UEA forward to help the businesses and residents within the UEZ zone, because there's there's tax benefits within the urban enterprise zone right. for for companies and stuff. So, I think we we need to work on those kind of projects to get that word out that that might entice, you know, maybe some more business downtown or something, because there are tax tax credits that are available to be in that UEZ zone. And you it's all about communicating and educating the folks about right. those things and so we appreciate what you do. You mentioned there being a change in Indianapolis in District 56. It will be different. Um, the numbers that are coming out and you're seeing them on the screen. Uh, Brad yes, Barrett defeated Dick Ham. Uh, 4,208 votes to 2,057 votes. Right. So your opponent is yeah, going to be I, Brad Barrett. I, uh, I was watching that there. So, so I kind of thought lost, you were looking if, over. If I, if I lost track, I was, you know, the politician and he was watching the scores. No problem. Yeah. I know you, so, a lot of people probably want to see you and talk to you also. Yeah. And we're going to give you a chance to get out of here. Tom Saunders, a winner in the District 54 right. race, uh, 420 votes. Obviously, that's only Wayne County's portion of that district, and you just mentioned the fact that there's only a part of, of the Hagerstown area that votes there. Um, again, for District 6, and again, this is not the entire District 6, but this is Wayne County's piece of it, Greg Pence. Um, obviously, the winner, 65.2% of the vote, 4,294 votes. Um, for U.S. Senate, Luke Messer, 47% um, of the vote at 3,049 votes, a total of 8,477 votes cast and in a race that was being watched, obviously, by a lot of people for Wayne County Sheriff Randy Redder on top, 2,964 votes, 43.1% of the vote. Todd Barker, 2,434 votes, 35.4% of the vote. And Donnie Benedict, 1,473 or 21.4% of the vote. Those numbers will continue to go by, and that is the other race between Mark Holzer and Beth Leisure, with Beth Leisure coming out on top, 812 votes to 639 votes for County Council District 3. They will be facing Nick Elder in the fall. We're going to take a break. We've got a couple of other people that we want to talk to, and we'll let Mr. Lott go. Thank, Thank you very you, much for being here with us this evening. Thank you again. Greatly appreciate it. We'll be back with the In Focus election special on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. That's totally the thing.
Hi, I'm Sherry Harlan, program host for Read Beside You. Join me on our next episode when our guests will be Dr. Jason Castleman, allergist from Read Health, and Heather Hart with Read Health Home Medical Equipment, and Jill Sisko from Dasco Read Home Medical Equipment. Join us Thursday at 8 o'clock on Channel 20 for Read Beside You. And welcome back to the In Focus election special on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. We're nearing that two-hour mark and beginning to lose it a little bit. <laughs> Thank you very much for spending some time with us. If you have not seen the numbers, um, we'll go through some of those. And I understand we have um, some of the winners from this evening's primary um, out, and we will bring them in in just a few minutes and talk to um, a few of them as we go. Um, what you're seeing are final numbers that we have gotten in. We have a couple of people coming in with us this evening, Betty Smith Henson and Bob Chamness. Um, thank you very much for being here, and I'm going to turn things over to Melissa. <laughs> it's been a fun night, and we are so glad that you're here with us. Um, thank you. Obviously, the two of you are leaving on top of the world tonight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but we appreciate you being with us. We, we've been starting off with just hearing a little bit about, um, telling us a little bit about yourselves and who you represent and what you do. So let's start off with you, Betty. My name is Betty Smith Henson. I'm the Wayne County Assessor. I um, took that position. I won the caucus in 2015. This is my first time to run for, have my name on the ballot for the County Assessor. Um, I um, had been the township assessor for over three terms, truly loved my job. I um, love working with the people, and um, we have a lot of exciting things happening in the county assessor's office. A um, lot of work to do, but we try to do our very best and make it fun while we're doing it. Well, you must be doing a great job because nobody wanted to go up against you. So, um, you. no, but the chamber has had an opportunity recently to partner with your office and to talk about um, personal property taxes and, and some things like that. And it's been an absolute pleasure to get to work with you and your team. So, thank you very much. We appreciate much. that. Thank you. Bob, tell us a little bit about you. Um, I, uh, I'm, I was a long-term county employee. I worked for uh, Wayne County for almost 40 years in the criminal justice system. I was a former Wayne County deputy sheriff and then a uh, probation officer and worked with the courts for about 30 years in uh, some of their administrative duties. So I've been uh, Wayne County. And then in 2014, I retired and ran for county council and was elected. Fantastic. So. Uh, We've, we've talked to others, but tell us a little bit about what you see as being some of the hot topics right now in regards to council and, and some of the things that um, you want to see moving forward. Well, some of the things that I've been very um, happy to see happen in my first three and a half years or so is uh, we had the opportunity to bring uh, do some work, road work repair so that Blue Buffalo could come to mm -hmm. town and bring those jobs to Wayne County, which is very important. I think that's probably the one thing, having worked in the criminal justice system uh, for those 40 years, we see a lot of people that 
go into uh, more of a, the, the problem areas of criminal justice because uh, there's no jobs in this community. There's very limited jobs. And so we, uh, we are very, very happy to see Blue Buffalo coming into town with all of those jobs. The Absolutely. other thing I think that was important was a cooperative issue that the county council had with uh, the city council, Richmond City Council, in uh, proposing uh, the, the, the Reed Hospital tear down and removal. Right. And I, I think that was something that I feel very good about Wayne County investing into that because that is something that affects the entire county. And and it leads into quality of place and different things of that right. nature too. So we, we uh, that was a very dangerous facility. The old law enforcement officer in me is coming to work here now is saying that, you know, those were a lot of people that were involved in going into that place and, and, and even squatting, so to speak, in that right. space. And, and uh, people could have gotten injured, but boy, that's, it's coming down pretty quick right now. And you know what, I've just, I've just seen um, an energy, I think a renewed energy mm -hmm. among folks, seeing mm -hmm. that come down and imagining the possibilities of what comes next. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on what that may be? <clears throat> well, I, I would say the commissioners and, and, the, and the city mm -hmm. uh, mayor and the council, city council, probably have better ideas of what's sure. going on. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> anything there that we can utilize that for, put it back on the tax rolls, mm -hmm. have Absolutely. an opportunity to start getting things moving in the right direction, I think that's very important. And, you know, those are just a few of the minor things in the three years. I, I Like I said, I was a, I, wor I worked for over almost 40 years in the, in, with the Wayne County uh, uh, Office of Sheriff and probation and court administration and that kind of stuff. So I, I saw that side of the fence pretty regularly. But now on council, we get to see things that are happening that will develop future jobs, will develop opportunities right. for renewed resources and opportunities that we can partner with other cities to get things done. You know, um, along those lines, when I moved back to Wayne County, which is my home, I moved back from Texas about 11 and a half, 12 years ago, um, after being gone for a number of years. And when we moved back, the unemployment rate was incredibly high at the time. I think we were the number two in the nation as far as unemployment rates, um, which was very concerning. And now that's completely mm -hmm. flipped. We've talked about earlier, I think the unemployment rate's 3.1% or something to that effect. And um, bringing those necessary jobs to the area, doing that work, collaborating with the cities and the towns to be able to put in a blue buffalo. Um, those are all exciting things and mm -hmm. we appreciate that effort and, and willingness to work together. To make I know Be happen. Betty and I have talked on several occasions about like wanting to see our county develop and, and to make it a place where we can have a, an opportunity to see our grandchildren stay here and prosper. Right. You know, now, now that I'm a grandparent, I, I see <laughs> that more interestingly, but uh, uh, we, we have the opportunity now to do some good stuff, and, and I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate what Betty does. She, she works uh, very hard. You know, I, uh, all the time she's talking about being the township assessor and the county assessor, uh, I was working in, in different aspects of, of county jobs, and I w used to watch her work, and she is a very hard worker. It's somebody that I always admired, so I appreciate yeah. that, Thank Betty. Thank you, Bob. You For are people too. who may not know, when you talk about the assessor's office. How do people interact with you and, and what are, are the duties of your office and how many people do you have on your staff? Right now there's a total of 10 people. Two of those are part-time positions. Mm -hmm. We um, have people coming in. Right now we're very busy with business personal property. That's uh, farmers and business people who come in and file their forms and we assist with that process. We um, are getting ready to send out what is called Form 11s that is going to give the new assessed value of your property. And then that opens up a window to appeal. You have 45 days, you can come in and appeal. And during that time, we go out and look at the properties and when a person appeals and if there's something that we've picked up that's not right, we'll make the correction. There's times we've gone out and we've found things that was not on the card and we have 
had to add that. Well, I'm sure so, they're real happy about that. No, I know. So, um, so don't complain unless it's real. <laughs> right, exactly. And right now, we uh, just this week started a cyclical reassessment, which the state says we have to do 25% of the county each year. So we have a four-year term to get that completed, and which I think is a very good way instead of waiting for 10 years and then all of a sudden you throw this high assessment mm -hmm. to the taxpayer. So this kind of gives, um, opens the window up for people to understand and, and taxes is never easy. You know, right. none of us like taxes, but we have to have it if we're going to have police protection of our fire protection, our trash pickup. You know, these are things I don't want to lose. So, and our schools. So, you know, we have, we have to pay taxes as much as we don't like to. And I do want to throw this in though. I have a friend that you said you used to live in Texas. Mm -hmm. They're moving back from Texas and she told me, Betty, I almost ran to the treasurer's office when I got my bill. She said, I was so excited yeah. because my taxes were so much cheaper here than they were uh, where she lived in Texas. So That's absolutely right. You know, mm -hmm. every, um, every state, they get their dollars from somewhere. The state of Texas doesn't have sales tax, so mm -hmm. it all gets rolled up into the property, property. tax there. Mm -hmm. um, huge difference. So you're exactly right. Yeah. That's what she said. Thank so. you both very much for spending a little bit of your time with us this evening. We're going to come close to actually wrapping this thing up. Good. Running Thank you. unopposed this evening, Betty Smith Henson, Wayne County Assessor, Bob Chamness, Wayne County Council. Thank you very much for one putting your names on a ballot. I, I don't think we've said that enough. Not everybody's willing to do that. A lot of us are willing to complain, but we're not willing to put ourselves out there to actually face the public. So thank you both for doing that thank and you. for your service yes, to the county. You. And, and yeah. I guess all I would like to say is I'd like to thank all the candidates who ran tonight. That takes right. courage to put your name on yes, that ballot and go before the voters. So appreciate all their yes. efforts, too. Thank I you, do, too. Thank, thank you for you. watching. We are going to take another break, and then we've got some very happy people out in our green room. Yes. We're going to bring them in and spend a few minutes with them as we come close to wrapping up our In Focus election special here on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. Keep up with local government information and shows with WGTV Online. Go to WCTV.info and click on the WGTV Online button. It's a live stream and video on demand site in one. Click the play button, you'll see whatever's on the air on WGTV Channel 11. Or scroll down for videos on demand. Choose whatever meeting or show you'd like to watch. It's easy to stay informed with WGTV Online, a service of Whitewater Community Television. Hi, Phil Quinn. Another episode of Access to the Arts focuses on the Nettle Creek players. 
It's a traditional summer stock company, uh, which means that we bring professional actors from all over the country. To and also the Secret Garden Tour, Richmond Art Museum fundraiser. We've got a special place where we're filming on location. The garden is different, and every year I think people come to see the different gardens to get ideas. It's another edition of Access to the Arts, Thursdays at 9 o'clock on WETV Channel 20. And welcome back to the In Focus election special on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. We've run the final numbers. You will see them as they continue on the screen. And we have three, they don't look happy. Well, you look happy. <laughs> sure happy yes, people here with us. Um, Melissa Vance from the Wayne County Area Chamber of Commerce, our partners in these candidate forums and election specials still with us. And we have Beth Leisure, Brad Barrett, Randy Redder, all winners in the races this evening, a couple of you still have to go through the fall. You may be done. How's that feel? <laughs> oh, it's really exciting, but you know, I, I've got such a great team. Uh, they've been with me every step of the way uh, for the last year, and they have been what's made this a success, and we're ready to carry it through November if we need to. Okay. First time out, first time on the ballot, you were almost a last minute entry into this thing. How does it feel? It's it's awesome. It's awesome. It's really been a roller coaster ride. You know, as I went through this whole process, I, I told people this is easier than my old job. You know, sometimes I didn't really think that was the case, though. Uh, there's certainly highs and lows. The campaigning is sure. it's brutal, and because I entered late, I had a lot of work to do in a short period of time. But. I got great support from my family. Today is my 25th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Congratulations. I'm very happy. And my wife, Marianne, has been putting signs out for the last two months, and we'll be picking them up the next day or two, and my kids. And then I had a great team working with me. So <clears throat> I was new to the process, but I had a seasoned team of veterans by my side. Nice. You went through the process once before. I did. Came through primary night. Not such a happy <laughs> one. Not this feels quite. a little bit was, different. Yeah, I was close, but I learned a lot. I met a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Running for an at-large seat the first time, and this was this was great. Running for a district and see all the support that came from all the people at the voting center today. That was it was just a great day to be out. Well, it was a beautiful day to be out for one, and so people have to be smiling when they're coming mm -hmm. in and out of the poll of the polls and the sun shining, and mm -hmm. so that helps, but. Of course, um, you have so much experience that you're kind of bringing to the table with chamber experience, tourism experience, um, so many other things. Mm -hmm. What do you think, um, moving into the, next, into the next season, what do you think is maybe the top two things that, that you're going to you know, grab a hold of and run with? Well, I think it is about um, just relationships and people knowing who you are. I'm going to work harder on the areas of my district that I don't know enough people. I've already made some contacts to do that. and um, Because your that, you're from Western Wayne, but yeah. your district includes some of Southern Richmond and... Abington, Boston. Right. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a big area. But I've met some key people in those areas, and I'm excited to work with them. And the Republican Party does a great job. Once uh, the primary is over, they help us all out with our race. That's great. So, That's yeah, great. We'll have some fun parades and picnics and all kinds of stuff. There you summer. go. Yeah. Lots of fun stuff. So, Randy... Um, again, we talked about this may be this may be it. You may not run contested in the in the fall. Sure, there's always that possibility. Yeah. But what do you think? Um, I know we've we've had some chats with you. People may or may not have watched our other discussions. But sure. what are you um, most excited about the potential of moving into this next role and being able to affect change? You know, I've had a uh, clear plan from the very beginning of, of my campaign. Um, when I made the commitment to do uh, to run for this office, uh, I started out by making this this clear plan, and. Um, 
you know, there are many things that we're going to carry forward uh, that's already in place, and there are a few things that I plan to expand on. And, um, you know, the, the support that I've gotten from the community uh, just reinforces the fact that, um, you know, I, I'm out there, I'm working for them, I'm trying to protect them, and uh, trying to give them the best uh, police services that I possibly can. Well, one thing we know for sure is that with Sheriff Kappa, you um, you have big shoes to fill, but sure. what a great model of, of what a sheriff could and should be. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's always a nice, nice yeah, thing as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah and I've, I've worked very closely with him uh, over the past several years and, and currently in charge of the enforcement division from our, uh, for our department. Uh, so we work very closely together, and, and uh, I, I plan to continue the work that he started. Your learning curve continues. Are there one or two things that you think are priorities for you to try to um, learn, get better at, get stronger with as you head towards your race in the fall? Well, I think just in general, I've really learned more about the community and all the different components and the chamber and economic development and education and certainly the health care issues, the heroin epidemic and, and how we can deal with that on, a, on, on multiple levels. So the slate is blank. I'm learning every day. I, I, I mentioned this at one of the forums that I feel like I have a panel of experts in this community, and I, and I mean that. There are things that I, I can learn and be better at, but I've, I've been in uh, relationship business for 25 years, communicating with people and stressful issues, and so I, I almost feel like my whole life has prepared me for this, for this next step. I'm very excited about it. We are going to let you all go and enjoy this evening. Beth Leisure, winner of a race for Wayne County Council District 3. Brad Barrett, winner of the race for Indiana House District 56. And Randy Redder, winner of a three-way campaign for Wayne County Sheriff. Congratulations to all of you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa, thank you and your staff for helping us out um, throughout this entire um, Our pleasure. election season. Um, with the with the in focus candidate forums, getting all the information out and everything else. Our pleasure. It's always great working with you and being in studio and your team and um, and really being able to use this forum to reach the community and, and share important information. So. We appreciate that opportunity. Thank you all very much for watching. We are going to continue to scroll those as we uh, head out of here. There will be some names coming up at the end of this, and, and I thank um, Ken Powell, Wayne County Commissioner, and as I mentioned, former board member of WCTV, and you for saying some, some nice things about me. I, I've said it a number of times, and it really is true. I kind of get to sit out here and, and quote unquote, be the face of this organization. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. There's volunteer camera operators, there's directors, there's people wrangling folks. All of those people are actually doing the work. I have the easy job to sit out here and do this. So to the staff, to Ryan Harris, Zach Watson, Samantha Parks, Steve Michael, um, Wes Miller, who has been helping us out, and Michelle Thompson, who has done some really great work for us and really helped make this evening right. very easy for us. Um, we thank you all very much. Those are members of our staff, full and part-time and volunteers. I have to personally thank my wife, who's been taking care of me this evening, um, running drinks She's and names great. and some of uh, <laughs> everything in and out to me and who allows me to um, be who I am out here. Thank you all very much for watching. We will be back in the fall with In Focus Candidate Forums and again on election night with an In Focus election special. Thanks for watching Whitewater Community Television, WGTV, Channel 11.